and Hispanics across California and the nation who don't work in agriculture are better off today because of what the farm workers taught people about organization, about pride and strength, about seizing control over their own lives. And the children and grandchildren of poor Hispanics are moving out of the fields and out of the barrio and into the professions and into business and into politics. And that movement cannot be reversed. Our union will forever exist as an empowering force My name is Emilio Huerta. I am an attorney. I am also a general counsel for the Dolores Huerta Foundation, and I represent other community-based nonprofit organizations uh, throughout California. It was pretty exciting, you know, pretty exciting life. Um, being the son of Dolores Huerta, as you can imagine, that uh, Dolores uh, involved her children in every aspect of her life. And so my first memories are growing up in Stockton, California, where I was born. My mother was always a person who was helping out people. We always had people coming to the door, asking for help, asking for food. And uh, we lived in a low-income community. And my father and his family are also from Stockton. My father was also uh, trying to help people uh, with medical services. Uh, my father was one of the first Latinos to graduate with a nursing degree as a registered nurse, and uh, he went on to become a director of public health clinics. And so uh, both of my parents were actively involved in the community. I remember succinctly uh, Fred Ross Sr., who, as we know, was the individual that uh, trained uh, both uh, my mother uh, and uh, Caesar to be community organizers. Uh, they both give him credit for basically uh, showing him house meetings and how to organize people and bring communities together. Fred Ross coming to our house, uh, wearing khakis, pretty much dressed the way I'm dressed now. And uh, a lot of meetings, meetings all the time. Right? Our, our, our lives were, if we wanted to be close to our parents, then we had to go where they were, which was in the board meeting and the community meeting. And so uh, in some respects, our family was very typical of a low-income family that you would find that grow, <coughs> lives here in the Central Valley. And then other times, you know, um, our family was uh, basically organizers from day one. Well, I think growing up, you know, we didn't really, as children, we didn't really um, maybe have the maturity or the world sort of sense of, uh, of, of the work that our parents were doing, you know. Caesar had decided to form a union for farm workers. Uh, Caesar and my mother both made the decision, Caesar first as the president of CSO, to, to leave the community service organization to organize farm workers. Uh, my mother and, uh, and, and Caesar, and then eventually other folks like Gilbert Padilla and Julio Hernandez, and of course, Larry Yitlong, um, they felt that uh, if you uh, can't help the poorest people, the people that are in most of need of representation and, and, and equity and justice, then you're, you're not, it, it's not enough. Knowing that people would acknowledge them and, 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 and see my mother and Caesar and the other UFW leadership as their leaders, as their representatives. And to know, for example, that my mother negotiated the first ever collective bargaining agreement, you know, for farm workers, right? But you gotta remember, you know, there was, uh, until 1975, there was no law ever in the entire United States that gave workers the right to collectively bargain to choose a representative of their own choosing. 
And here, my mother and Caesar were doing this in the 60s, right? Where they were getting rid of at-will termination. They were, uh, their contracts had a, a remedy uh, for grievance and, grievances and arbitration to resolve uh, uh, disputes at the work site, right? Fringe benefits and getting rid of uh, dangerous pesticides like DDT. This is, this is what's already happening uh, in, in, the, in the 60s. And then, to, so, so to see the workers look up to my mom, you know, particularly male workers, and to see uh, the, com the ag community who was fearful of my mom, intimidated by my mom and what they were doing, my mom and Caesar and, and the folks, then I, I think we be, as children, we begin to recognize that my mother wasn't ours. She belonged to the farm worker community. The union played a significant role in terms of our education and our background. Uh, Caesar and the board established the Welga School, and so you know they would give us uh, Tim Kelly, who was a music teacher, uh, would would uh, teach us how to read music, and I played the soprano recorder and learned how to play the guitar, and then they would have after school programs. Um, but I think really my education really started maybe in the 70s. Uh, you got to remember we grew up learning about collective bargaining. Uh, we learned about uh, what a uh, restraining order was and what, what it meant to fight for elections and uh, we learned these terms like unfair labor practices and we didn't learn any of that in school we learned that by hanging around the union and going to picket lines and economics right we were learning economics you know why were the growers so opposed to a union um, was it because it was a union of mexicans and brown people or was it just pure greed in my mind it was pure greed right exactly they wanted to keep wages suppressed and they don't want to uh, give people living wages and uh, and of course when the union came in they created a whole uh, middle class right and so uh, after dropping out and working in the UFW print shop with Paul Chavez uh, there in La Paz Caesar uh, invited me to participate in a school of collective bargaining it was called the Fred W. Ross School of Collective Bargaining there in La Paz uh, the union had won a bunch of elections uh, to represent maybe over 100,000 workers throughout the state of California and so they needed somebody to negotiate contracts. So I was asked to participate in, in, in a program where I was trained how to uh, draft collective bargaining agreements, how to uh, put together uh, economic proposals for wages, hours, working conditions, fringe benefits, pension, that sort of thing. But after negotiating for a few years, then I decided that I wanted to be a lawyer because at the negotiating table, at the bargaining table, I was dealing with lawyers. These big law firms, the growers would hire these, these huge law firms to come in and some local attorneys. And so um, I, uh, Homer Montavo, who uh, grew up in Rich Grove, uh, was part of the California State University. Then it was Cal State, now it's CSUB Bakersfield. Um, ben Maddox said, well, if you're gonna leave the union to go to school, you know, let's go talk to Homer. And uh, Ben and I went and talked to Homer. And uh, Homer said, okay, we're gonna get you into uh, California State University. Again, I'm a high school dropout. I had gotten my GD uh, several years before at uh, Cal Poly uh, University in, in San Luis Obispo. And, uh, but I hadn't gone to school. I hadn't been technically in the classroom uh, since I was 16 and now I'm 23. So I took a placement test got into the EOP program uh, with uh, Lee Adams at Cal State Bakersfield. Uh, signed up, it was on the quarter system. Uh, within three years I had graduated, uh, applied to law school, to about a dozen law schools. I think I got accepted to about 10 of them and uh, decided to go to Santa Clara University, a good Jesuit school uh, because they were small classes and they were tough teachers, right? And I remembered my religious upbringing and I thought, well, okay, these are the, you know, if I'm gonna go to school to learn something, I want people that are really gonna uh, really educate me and give me the tools that I want to, uh, that I'm gonna need. I always knew I wanted to come back and help people. And I thought, wow, you mean I can be a lawyer and get paid for doing what I'm willing to do for free? I thought it was the greatest thing ever. I still would think that way, right, every day, you know, and so, uh, I went ahead, once I graduated uh, from uh, Santa Clara University, came back to the Bakersfield, came back to the Union, and uh, then I really learned to be a lawyer. I, mean, I, um, I already knew how to negotiate contracts. 
I had already done arbitration cases, had already uh, represented the union in unfair labor practice and election hearings, but now it was the more traditional civil work and that kind of stuff. And that's, that's where I really learned to, uh, uh, to hone my practice. A few years later, in 1993, after uh, Caesar passed away, being the son of Dolores and you know growing up with uh, Paul and the Chavez family and, and, and Anthony Chavez and you know everyone, then I always felt I was a member of the tribe, and so I always wanted to be with the tribe and doing the work that we all did, you know, which was help uh, advance the rights of farm workers. And so uh, when I came back in '93. Uh, and of course, the goal was to make sure that the union survive Caesar's passing. And Caesar did a great job of teaching us how to put together budgets and, you know, management by objectives and coming up with uh, strategic plans and that sort of stuff. Uh, I was working for the in-house union law firm, and Paul had asked me to help out with the uh, with the uh, the nonprofit. And I was really upset because I really didn't want to work with the nonprofits. And so Marcos Camacho, who's now Judge Camacho, he was the head of the law firm. And so I wanted to bang on tables and beat up growers and fight for wages and uh, get workers their jobs back and that kind of stuff. And they had signed me to work with the nonprofits. And I said, well, you know, not really much into saving whales and butterflies, you know, I, didn't, I don't get it, right? And the union was a nonprofit. And for the most part, all of our work was in furtherance of charitable nonprofit purposes all our lives, but I didn't put it in that context. And so when I came back and they said, you know, I had already won an ERISA lawsuit and uh, they said, you have to uh, work with the nonprofits. And so Paul said, come and help me for six months, nine months. And if you don't like it, you know, um, then nobody's gonna give you a hard time about leaving, wanting to leave, you know? And so I said, fine. Of course, Paul and I grew up together and you know we had a lot of trust and faith in each other. And so I started working with the housing. Paul was doing affordable housing. Caesar, before he had passed away, had launched this affordable housing initiative. And so when I started working with Paul and putting together real estate contracts, we started working with low-income housing tax credits, working with multi-million dollar financing and equity funds and that kind of stuff. You know, I kind of got excited about this. And I remember that this was in like, Caesar had passed away, I think, in, in April of 93. This was around September of 93. I was uh, really confused and, and, and I felt conflicted because it wasn't really the career path that I had outlined for myself. I want to be a labor lawyer. I want to represent workers, right? I want to beat up employers. And now I'm putting together uh, a real estate deal and I'm dealing with equity investors. And I'm talking to banks and, and so, I had never been exposed you know, to that type of work. And so I remember by December of, 2020, of 1993, that same year, I was in federal court. I had sued the city of Fresno. They had tried to take away our zoning. I was using the Fair Housing Rights Act. You know, I was advocating for this uh, uh, low-income housing project that was gonna house 150 families, about 400 kids, right? And I won, you know, I filed this lawsuit, I won. And then the, the neighborhood group, the Fig Garden group out of Fresno, a very high income uh, uh, population, was suing us to stop the project. And so now we're in round two, and I was working with another attorney, Joel Murillo, there in Fresno, you know, and we won that case. And wow, there's, there's something to this. There's some fundamental, basic human rights that are involved in providing affordable housing. And then I kind of was convinced that, yes, this is a place where, where I could do uh, my, 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 my work and, and, and provide purpose to my life my, in, in, in a professional sense. I ended up doing that for 20 years. You know, I told Paul I would do it for six months and I ended up doing it for 20 years and helping uh, the, uh, now the Cesar Chavez Foundation, then the National Farm Workers, uh, grow their affordable housing program. How many people of color do we have as principals and administrators, right? very few, if any, right? How do we expect these people to be sympathetic to the needs and understand uh, people's lives? People that look like me, people that were raised like me, people who are poor, right? 